about this earth that God is after. He wants to establish his kingdom here. Because there's something bigger about this world than what it looks like even right now in our galaxy. This is a seed of what is to come, like our earthly bodies are seeds of what is to come. There's something great about the earth. Now it will be renewed at the end of time, the beginning of the new era. It will be renewed. And so it will be, it, it, it will be, it, it, it will fulfill God's purpose for it. It will be much grander. Lower creation right now is awesome, and it's a speck of dust compared to what it will be. Most of the ocean we have not even plumbed yet. Humankind has not been, has not explored most of the ocean. Over, over 70% is untouched by humanity. There are, and, and, for, and we're still, I mean, the Earth atmosphere even, is million, hundreds of millions of light years of expanse constantly of the universe. 96% of lower creation reality. This is, a, this is a, an actual statistic I read in a book by a famous physicist. 96% of the observable universe is completely unknown to us. Science tells us that. It's either dark matter or dark energy. Physicists know it's there, but don't know what it is. 4% of reality is what all science tells us we know. And yet it's oftentimes science is cited to prove that God doesn't exist. They say there's no proof. So how do you know there's no proof? First of all, the 4% we know does prove it. Second of all, you only know 4% of reality. And even that you don't know very well. <laughs> Lower creation as it is, is beyond our imagination and is still to be renewed. This earth is what God is after. Pray, he says, that your kingdom come, your will be done, your plan be done on the earth as it is in heaven. That's what God is after. Jesus became a human. He became part of earth's legacy. He's the son of man. So the way God, the way that God gets his kingdom on the earth is by creating humans to rule it. So at the center of this plan to consume the earth with his, his kingdom is his son, Jesus. Jesus is the king as the son of God. Jesus is the center of this kingdom. This is why Jesus called the gospel the gospel of the kingdom. <laughs> it is the gospel of him. It's the gospel of With the Son. In Genesis chapter 1, what is the image of God? We don't have to turn there. In Genesis 1.26, he says, Let us make Adam in our image. He uses it, and he refers to himself in the plural. You ever notice that? <clears throat> and he does it there in 126. It interrupts the grammar of the narrative so far. It's been in the sing The word Elohim in Hebrew is plural, but the pronoun referring to Elohim is he in the context. But in verse 26, it's us. Why does he suddenly interrupt the grammar to refer to himself now in the plural? Because he's referring to humanity, and humanity is a plurality who will reflect his image. So the image of God in the verse is reflected. Okay, the image of God is reflected in humanity in two ways. There's many ways, but there's two ways that pop out in the word in, in, in this verse. What does God tell them to do? Rule the earth. To rule. Mm -hmm. To rule. Mm -hmm. So the way they reflect his image is one, by ruling, and two, by their plurality. Let us make Adam in our image. In our likeness, let us make them. Male and female, let us make them. Mm. So Adam is first referred to as a plurality. So this son who was to become human is, is the king representative of a multifaceted humanity, a, plural, a plurality, an international people that joins the son as his bride in ruling the universe, in ruling heaven and earth. 
with as co co rulers with God. That is God's plan. So the plan's specific. It's like oh, I just want to rule the world. It's like no, I'm going to process this over millennia to work this plan. I'm going to create the earth a certain way. I'm going to create humanity a certain way, not in their final form. And we're going to develop, oh, sin interrupts it. So I'm going to deal with sin, but my dealing with sin is not just to get people out of the garbage heap. It's to redeem them into this purpose. So when Paul is going preaching the gospel in the nations, he's not just trying to get people you know, from going to hell to going to heaven. That's a huge line to cross. That's stage one. But he wants them filled with the knowledge of God's will. So that, and if you'll read on, so that they'll live their lives ethically and in terms of their destiny with purpose. This purpose, not your purpose. This purpose. Those clay people, I want ruling the world, or I'm not ruling that earth. If they're not ruling it, I'm not ruling it. That's the way I've done it. That's the way I've set this up. That's why King David is like the, the main figure of the Messiah in the Old Testament. A picture of the one who was to come. What, what comes down at the pinnacle of the old creation, the beginning of the new, what comes down from heaven, from God? The new Jerusalem. It's the city of the king. It's the climactic moment in scripture. This beautiful city descends onto the earth, on Mount Zion. Isaiah 2. Come, let's go up to the mountain, to the house of the Lord. He will teach us his ways. And it's the mountain. It's the chief mountain of all the mountains of the earth. This is why we preach the gospel to all nations. Because this people... They will rule everything, so they must come from everywhere. For God to bring in harvest, not just from Israel, but from all nations, and to bring them into one new man, is a picture of a united universe in the future. Which is always the issue when Paul's writing his epistles. People, on some level, are not getting along. And oftentimes, because... It's a Jew-Gentile issue, something we, we can't even identify with usually. But people from different backgrounds and customs, the religious people of God, that one nation God chose to touch the other nations, they had a certain way of doing things. When other people are brought into their community, they have a dif difficulty getting on back and forth. So what Paul says is, if you guys are letting this divide you, you don't understand the gospel. Because the gospel creates a new people for this. Because it's a reflection of his ultimate plan. So, so the church has to look like this now. That's why we preach to all the nations, because we're harvesting all these different sorts of people. Because if they can become one in the Messiah, it's a prophecy of a united universe in the future. The church should be, should be a prophecy of this. The church, the word ekklesia, the assembly. Uh, we'll write ekklesia. That's the Greek word for church, the, as the assembly. It should be prophesied. We should be a little picture. Excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry. That's your phone. Oh, that's fine. I'm sorry. When Paul sees a church in Rome scattered, people's hearts are not melting together in something bigger than the marks of Judaism, kosher, circumcision. When he sees that happening, what's the first thing he does? You think Romans is just some exposition about grace? <laughs> Romans is a restating of the gospel to pull those people back together. Paul says if you're not worshiping together, you don't understand the gospel. Because the gospel is the gospel of the kingdom that makes Jesus king of all. And you should be united, not just because it's nice to get along, but because that's what the king's rule looks like. That's what it will look like someday in all the universe. Every aspect of creation will be harmonized. That's the mark of his rule. So, so should you. So you need something. You're not established, he's told the Romans. And, he's, and then he, ahead of him, he sent his letter to be read as a sermon and proclaim the gospel all the way through chapter 11 is the gospel. 